All right, I think it's hit four o'clock. Um, welcome everyone. We are, hopefully we've got everyone here. I'll just stop sharing this and you'll be able to see everyone at the moment. Okay, all right, let's make a bit of a start. Welcome, my name's Scott Duncan. Um, I'm a teacher at Scotch College. I teach mathematics and I'm a house head here as well. Um, I am seeing today and I'm emceeing as a board member for the Association for Learning Environments. Um, before we start though, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. So, I respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting, the Wajak Noongar people. It is a privilege to be standing on Wajak Noongar country. I also acknowledge the contributions of Aboriginal Australians and non-Aboriginal Australians to the education of all children and people in this country we all live in and share Australia. Now, today we're trying something a little bit different. So please bear with us if anything goes wrong. We think we've got all of the tech sorted and we're ready to go with that. Um, but it is possible, we've got backup plans. And you might be able to see in the background behind you, we're actually all in the same building, um, but we're just showcasing different areas. Personally, myself, um, right now, this is actually two classrooms, not one. There's just a massive skyfall door open between them. So, um, the other thing as well that I would like to do is make sure to thank our sponsors. So, Association for Learning Environments, so Armstrong Flooring, Armstrong Ceiling Solutions, Breezeway, Woods Furniture, of which I'm sitting on at the moment, and Decor Systems. Now, the actual format for today, we're going to be presenting first. So we'll have our Cara Fugil speaking very briefly to start off with, and then sending it over to our architects. From there, educators are going to talk about how they've then been using the building and looking into the future. And we'll wrap it up with a Q&A session. Um, if you look down the bottom of your screen, you'll also see there are two sections, chat and Q&A. Please feel free to use both. The chat section, just talk and say whatever you want. Hi, fill it up, go for it. Uh, the Q&A section is actually a section where if you have any questions as the presentations are going or during the session, or when we go into the Q&A, please post them in there, because what I'm going to do is try and grab you out, bring you into the conversation at the end of the Q&A, and get you to ask our panelists any questions you have. So, in order to give you a bit of an idea of the space that has been built and designed here, uh, we're going to show you a short video. Um, hopefully it all works. I'm sure it will work perfectly. Um, and this is a really great video. It gives you a good idea of the space before we talk about it a bit more.
Hopefully that gave you a bit of an idea of the space that we're in. Um, so this is Scotch College, Western Australia, uh, not Scotch College, Adelaide or Melbourne or Scots College, um, but I am Scott Duncan. And there's a lot of different bits and pieces there. <laughs> um, we're a boys school um, and we're really quite fortunate with what we're able to have at our school. It's a high socioeconomic school um, fee paying and United Church background. So, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Cara Fugil, who is our Director of Teaching and Learning at Scotch College, uh, to talk to you very briefly about how we start off with our architects. Thanks, Scott. Um, I'm just going to start by providing some background information that will explain how this project came to be and the brief that Scott that Scotch gave to the architect. So after hearing from um, the architects and viewing the building, we'll come back and delve more into the details around the process, the technology um, and how we use the building. So the first question is why a state of the art teaching and learning facility? I think we had four main reasons for going ahead with this project. Um, and the first is that the current teaching spaces that the maths department were using were limited in their ability to be able to deliver a 21st century curriculum. Um, with regards to where they were situated, um, they were actually old boarding dormitories. So the rooms themselves were very dimly lit um, they were lower down in the ground, so it was very hard to, to reach up to the windows, to open the windows. There were floorboards underneath that made it really noisy. Um, they were very odd shaped, so once the boys were in the room, it was very fixed in the way that it was set up, and it was very hard to move around that space. Um, so with that, there was, there was um, the inability to be able to, sorry. There's the inability to be able to um, move around and work with the boys individually, nor the ability for them to be able to collaborate. So it certainly suited that didactic teaching style, which is standing up the front and delivering. And I think if you have a look at those pictures, you can see that it, it lacks relevance for this generation is not particularly inspiring. So what is it that um, contemporary teaching spaces are able to do and what is it that we wanted our teachers to be able to do in their classrooms? And the practice, contemporary teaching practice tells us that it's very much about student-centred learning. It's highly collaborative. We're all about trying to build engagement with our boys. Um, we'd like the opportunity to deliver uh, in different modes. So we might want to team teach. We might want to have breakout groups. We um, we need flexibility in the way that we're delivering our, our lessons. The boys want to be in inspiring surroundings. They need to be light filled. The furniture needs to be utilized. So um, being able to have whiteboards that they can access or um, technology that they can tap into and that can support multiple devices um, to emulate really what they're gonna experience in the real world. So I think um, it's one thing to believe in what you're doing and I think it's another thing um, to know that the decisions that you're making reflect what the community wants but also what the students need. So we used a fair bit of data to drive this decision making process. So we um, use MMG survey data every year and although parents uh, indicated that they valued the facilities, they actually rated quality teaching and learning as the highest priority. And as much as we had um, high levels of satisfaction, there was certainly disparity between junior school and middle school, where we'd put a fair bit of funding into our teaching spaces more recently. Um, and senior school at that stage probably um, hadn't been touched for a while. So staff requests were also to modernise the teaching spaces, which meant that they were there was a desire for them to move away from that traditional teaching methods. Um, and in doing so, we upgraded the, the media lab, the commerce, English block library, the STEM open area. Um, but at the same time, that approach is not particularly sustainable. So um, I think that's another reason that drove this decision. And finally, we were looking at a, pre a research project uh, with our students where we interviewed our students and we um, found that 
that the didactic teaching methods that were being delivered in the classroom were actually making them far too heavily reliant on, um, on the teacher. And we wanted to build independent skills for our students that would, um, you know, that would help them to cope with this ever-changing world that they're about to enter post-secondary. So, and then finally is, I guess, the larger piece of the puzzle, which is when you build a building like this that is such high quality, um, it's a real statement piece. And um, it was sending a message to our community. And I think those core messages are that academics are a high priority here. Um, we care about our students' experience. We want them to be challenged, inspired, to reach their potential, to dream about what they can be whilst they're at school. We want our teachers to feel valued. We know that teaching can be a really creative craft when put in the right space. Um, and this gave them the opportunity um, you know, to, to be in a space that allows them to think outside the box. And we also wanted the broader community to understand that whilst we're still um, true to our traditions, we can also be progressive and forward thinking. So that was kind of the brief that we gave um, and a very small snapshot of how this project came to light. And it's, it's where we started with Taylor Robertson, Cheney and Broderick. So back to you, thanks Scott. Thanks very much, Cara. Um, so now we're going to pass on to our architects. Um, just by the way, we also have uh, Brad Tyrrell sitting next to Cara Fugel. He's our uh, Dean of Information and Learning Technology. Um, and he's been an integral part of the process the whole way through as well, um, with lots and lots of ideas. Um, right now though, I'm going to send across to our architects. So we have uh, Lee Robinson, who is the Director of TRCB Architects, and Lawrence Lim, who is a Senior Associate also at TRCB. Um, afterwards, they're going to throw across to our Landscape Architects from Four Landscape Studio, and that is Andrew Thomas and Tilly Caddy, and they describe themselves as people. <laughs> um, thanks, Lawrence and Lee, over to you. Sure, thank you. Let's take control of the screen. Oops. Hopefully you can all see that. Okay, are we away? Um, yeah, thanks Scott and Cara and Brad. Um, thanks to everyone who's hopefully out there watching us now. Thanks for taking taking time away from the daily routines of washing our hands and worrying about whether we're one and a half or two metres away from everybody and to attend yet another Zoom meeting, things that have become part of our, all of our lives over the last two months or so. Um, I'm Lee Robinson from Taylor Robinson, Cheney, Broderick and Lawrence. Um, Lawrence Lim was the project architect for this exciting project. The Scotch College, as, as was briefly outlined, is, is in its 123rd year. It's a secondary boys' school in the western suburbs of Perth, not far from the coast. Um, it is, like all schools of that age, it's undergone a variety of developments over many years and inevitably, of course, some of the original build, school buildings, which are still largely in use, um, pretty much as Cara showed in their original form. Um, and some of those were built um, around the time of the Second World War and some of them even earlier than that. The college has about 1,500 students um, and provides um, teaching and learning from kindergarten through to year 12. We've been fortunate enough to have been working with the college um, for just over 20 years and during that time have undertaken a few significant buildings on the campus. Some of them are visible in this drawing, in this slide, um, science and design and technology. Um, off to the left there, a new 1,200-seat um, auditorium for the college. And out of view, across the road, um, 
a middle school project completed in about 2015. This particular project, the Teaching and Learning Building, which is sort of in the centre of this image, had a construction budget of about 13 and a half million. It was built over a, approximately 16 months. It's three levels, lower ground, ground and first, and includes 15 GLAs, 13 of which are individual rooms with connecting doors, two of which have been combined into what's called a flexible learning space. There's a dual teaching space, which is a pretty cool word for a mini lecture theatre, sort of university style accommodation for about 80 students. There's a staff room for about 16 staff and a year 12 room uh, on the lower ground level. It also houses lockers for two of the school's houses and the central reprographics area for the, for the college. Next one. Uh, this is an aerial view of the senior campus. Um, the college is divided down the middle almost by Shenton Road, which is um, that main road running um, left to right across the screen. The senior campus is on the southern side of the road and the uh, middle and junior school and boarding and playing fields are all on the northern side. In the top right hand view of this slide, you can just glimpse the middle school building. Um, the site, uh, the building was built in the um, northeastern quadrant of this senior campus, so that's the right hand, top right hand corner of this, this aerial view. It was the last, really the last remaining spot on the site that a building could be located. Um, this site, um, whilst other sites were considered, this one had particular importance because it enabled a more visual connection to be uh, created between the senior campus and the middle and junior school buildings um, across Shenton Road. When the middle school project was done, an underpass was done that provided safe and easier access for boys moving between the two campuses. And it seemed only fitting that eventually a new building would be built in this location to provide a stronger connection, at least visually, um, across Shenton Road. Next slide. This is the view with the building finished. Um, the new TNL building now sits with a hard edge to Shenton Road, a six metre setback. Um, the scope of the project sort of grew a bit as, as, a, as is often the case with um, building projects and encompass not only the building, the what was used to be called the, the College Oval. Um, it's now a little bit, um, bit of a grandiose word for what is a, a sort of large green space in the middle of the school and external paving activating the spaces, not only around the building, but also to that right hand edge of the pool, providing both vehicular and pedestrian access um, across the campus. Okay. And now, look, I'll hand over to Lawrence to talk you through the, the planning arrangements of the building. So what you're looking at here is the lower ground floor plan. And uh, if you were to enter the building, uh, uh, you would enter from the northern or the eastern side. Uh, you can see the three GLAs, uh, so um, general learning areas or classrooms, uh, one of which Scott is seated in at the moment. Um, those are in blue. Uh, and they have a connection to an outdoor learning space and an uh, internal learning street, so uh, incidental learning area. And that was important, and, and uh, as Cara had alluded to in, in um, uh, her opening address, that was uh, critical to the brief. The rooms themselves house about 30-odd students, um, and they're separated with a skypole door. So... Uh, each one of those rooms can be opened up to the one adjacent to it. So you can use those rooms in a single configuration or a two classroom configuration or a, a three classroom configuration where you would in an exam situation and you need clear line of sight um, across um, the whole room. Uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, there's a year 12 leadership space on this level and that also opens out to the external uh, uh, learning area. Um, and that 
was briefed to us as a transition space to university for year 12 students. Um, it has a, its key focus is an area for study, so it's not a common room. Uh, but it's, um, it, it contains uh, individual workspaces and paired and grouped workspaces. And uh, it's flanked with uh, meeting rooms on the, I guess, the western edge of it. Uh, also in, that, in this slide, you can see the offices that are adjacent to the Year 12 leadership space. And that um, it really is there to provide pastoral care to, to the students as well, to make them feel like they're not alone. Um, there's a reprographic space, which Lee had mentioned earlier, and the, and the lockers and uh, staff amenities, um, as you might expect. This level here is a ground floor level. Um, and again, uh, you'll see the, the three GLAs, so maths, classrooms, um, and that is a consistent spatial configuration across all three levels. Um, on this level, you would enter the building on the oval side, um, and that's on the, the, the southern part of the building. Um, again, the, those GLAs to your left, if you were to enter, would, um, uh, would be connected through that internal um, learning street. Uh, the dual teaching space or that small lecture room um, is adjacent to a flexible learning space, which is used as an extension to the lecture space and facilitates group presentations and activities. Um, and they all open out to an uh, outdoor learning space to the south, which has tiered seating and Andy and Tilly can talk more about that. Um, there's meeting rooms that serve as an ancillary function to the uh, flexible teaching space as well. The upper level, so first, first floor and the, and the last of the floors. Um, again, we have our three GLAs in, uh, on that northern edge. And to the south of those is the staff work area and conference room. So that conference room can be used by staff, but um, it was briefed to us as a space that students could potentially use as well. Um, there's um, a flip studio uh, adjacent to the staff work area and that's designed to house permanent video recording equipment um, that allows students to flip content that's written up on a screen for distribution on uh, digital platforms. Uh, there's a meeting room and that, that meeting room right in the centre of the floor plan is where Lee and I are seated at the moment. Um, and uh, GLAs 10 to 13, which form the business centre. Um, so part of the brief, this is a maths and business building, and part of the brief was to have GLAs specifically designed for uh, the, the um, business, what well, to teach business from. Uh, they distinguish themselves from the maths classroom, and that's, that's how they were located here to create their own precinct. And they have their own view of the city from the northeastern classroom. classroom. Uh, the finishes in that room are slightly more restrained than the maths rooms. And uh, rooms 12 and 13 uh, are separated by an operable wall, which allows those rooms to be combined. And they all open out to the balcony. So this, this slide really, um, this, uh, this slide is about the, the interior design of each level, which took its design cues from the works of Rene Descartes, Euclid, and what, Alan Turing. Um, you'll see some of that in these, these slides here where the two-dimensional geometry is being transposed onto the wall and uh, framed using timber battens on the back side of that, that photo. Um, so they've been painted out white. Um, there's little Easter eggs that we stuck into the building, like the uh, billiard ball lighting that's hanging from the ceiling. Uh, that's arranged to form a sign curve. And elsewhere in the building, we have LED strip lights and circular down lights that have been used to spell out letters in Morse code. Um, the uh, the meeting rooms 
that are located in the central part of the building um, uh, where there's a level change between each floor. Uh, these are glazed and framed with timber um, and that's to increase access to light. So touching on what um, Cara had mentioned earlier. Um, and they provide a warmth and texture to the finishes, which uh, reflects the timber that's used um, externally as well, which you'll see in some of Andy and Tilly's slides. Here you're seeing the um, floor plan. Uh, so the floor finishes, you can see how some of those um, geometries have been cut into uh, the resilient floor finishes and the inlaid carpet. And they're just taken straight out of the textbook and applied onto the floor. Um, so hopefully the kids will recognize those. Um, the ceilings also took some design inspiration from the triangular geometries that are found from those textbooks, um, if I can use that term, uh, whilst also assisting with the acoustics of the space. And you'll see that most notably, I guess, in the classrooms and in the um, lecture space that uh, Andy and Tilly are in at the moment. Um, the flexible learning space to the south of that, that room uh, has cutouts in the ceilings to mirror the floor patterns, just to reinforce uh, that, that patterning. On this first floor, um, I'm sure if anyone's seen the imitation game, uh, you'll recognize the custom cut metal balustrade that has uh, been laser cut with a graphic that shows the dials of Alan Turing's Enigma machine. And these are some photos of um, the flexible learning area. Um, so you, I think you've seen this slide before. Um, so the technology setup is much the same as, as what you're seeing in the classrooms. And I think Brad, later on you, in the presentation, you're gonna talk, talk about that. Um, so we won't dwell too much, but there is a, you can see there's a mix of uh, furniture options in the space. Um, and that is directly related to the activities that the students might uh, participate in. So this is the dual teaching space, the mini lecture theatre. Uh, again, the attention um, with ceiling patterns, um, um, geometrical patterns or geometric patterns in the ceiling has been undertaken in this building, not only um, to continue that mathematics theme, but obviously also to uh, address the acoustics in this particular building. So all, all the teaching spaces um, have been connected um, with a variety of um, devices, skyfold doors on the lower ground level that allow the whole wall to be to disappear into the ceiling, bifold doors, um, and in these these rooms you're looking at here, um, sliding doors that, that allow sections of walls still to be available as teaching areas uh, within the classrooms that they adjoin. That's a view of the lower ground with the skyfold doors. The first time we've used the skyfold doors, they're, they're still very expensive, but as you can see, they provide, um, um, this, this room will be used for exams, so three classrooms can be converted into one very simply, um, and there's absolutely no division uh, between the rooms. So this, this image here is the Northern Stair, and it's just outside of the room that Lee and I are seated in. Um, and you can see the colored glass and the sun shades that tie back to the, the patterning and the textures that we, um, we took inspiration from the, um, the, the tartans. And you can see some of that line work uh, coming through um, internally as well as on the ex external elevation. And uh, that's a view of the room that Lee and I are seated in at the moment um, without us in it. Um, but these, these are formed, uh, this is a meeting room and there's a meeting room below us, which is where Brad and Cara are at the moment. So the, the timber that we mentioned earlier, that's wrapped around all of these rooms. 
just another view of the, this is the eastern staircase to the building and again those uh, strong geometric shapes um, showing in the eastern glazing. And just to finish with a couple of shots of the external of the building, this is the main conference room in that big picture box window, TV window, um, looks back over the uh, central part of the school. And what have we got next, Lawrence? Is that the last one? Um, oh, and this is just a nice shot, a nighttime shot of the southern side of the building. The college, uh, this is the oval area is where the school gathers every Friday. Um, at the beginning of the house marching, marching into assembly. Um, there's 10 houses at the college and they've been depicted with the college tartans in those coloured colored windows um, as, that are part of the staff room on level one. Okay, now I think that's us. Um, we now hand over to Andrew and Tilly, the landscape architects for the project. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Thomas uh, and this is Tilly Caddy. We're both uh, registered landscape architects and we worked on this project with both the school and uh, TRCB uh, to do all of the external elements associated with the project. Uh, and we are simply people. Okay, so when we asked Scotch College Maths Department to provide a brief for the creation of the external learning environments, we expected to get back from them maybe a simple list or some photocopies from, of some equations from a textbook, uh, but no, the result was this 29-page document um, that was provided to us that just absolutely exceeded all of our expectations uh, of what to include in the external learning environment. Uh, it was important to us that um, the college provided guidance to us on as to what was to be included uh, in the external spaces. We could have harked back to our time at high school uh, maths and then also relied on Google for the rest. Um, however, this brief has given us an authentic um, has given us authentic um, maths narratives to be included. Um, into the design that we know are relevant for the project. So using this brief, we created uh, this maths narrative plan, which includes over 19 learning opportunities that are integrated throughout the site. There's a mixture of obvious integrations for whole class external learning, as well as more subtle inclusions for students to notice as they move throughout the campus. Unified and connecting the corners of the site are numerous feature concrete ribbons which are made from exposed aggregate. You can uh, see them um, now being pointed out to you. Um, some of these ribbons have math sequences sound blasted into the surface including pi to 340 decimal places, the Fibonacci sequence and triangular and prime numbers. So similar to the uh, we also um, embedded a music narrative into the design. Uh, having worked with Scotch College previously, we knew that their pipe band and school marching activities are a strong part of the college's identity and culture and saw an opportunity to weave the school song, which is called Highland Cathedral, uh, into the design. Uh, so this is the music department being pointed out to you now. Um, and you can see it's close proximity to the new build and then also to the oval where traditionally uh, the school have um, commenced their um, marching. Uh, so we included an additional concrete ribbon linking the music department to the oval, which celebrates this. Uh, and the sheet music of Highland Cathedral was also then used another time to create feature screening elements that are found along the northern elevation of the site. So we're now going to take you out of plan and uh, start walking you around the site, uh, starting from here, which is the underpass connecting the middle school to the secondary school. People arrive from the middle school. This is the, uh, the component of the project that they see first as they come out of the uh, underpass. Uh, and you arrive at a, a, a section of these ribbons that uh, start taking you off and telling you the mathematical journey 
Uh, so these two are, are prime and triangular numbers. Uh, and the changes in materiality also help kind of define space and, and break up the large expanses of hard stand that we previously have had um, in the campus. Uh, we also have, these are the uh, screens which tie back to the architecture and the uh, pieces inside the building that uh, Lee and Lawrence spoke about. Uh, and so these uh, screens have taken the um, their design motive from the music, the sheet music notes, uh, and then they've also been utilised to help screen uh, the area from the road. So the, the building is very close to Shenton Road, uh, which is quite a busy road, and we wanted the, the classrooms to flow out into that breakout space, but we also wanted some elements of privacy to, to and screening for people that are moving up and down Shenton Road, uh, and then also an element of softness uh, from, inside, from inside the building when you're looking out. Uh, and then also we could we use the screens to break up the space externally so they they relate more closely to the internal uh, classroom spaces and then they double up as seating spaces for students to use during uh, um, lunchtime and, and classroom breaks well thanks scott you can uh, see outside <laughs> yeah. scott's window um, another perspective <laughs> of that <laughs> and then this is the view from shenton road so from the the roadside you're looking in and and, and you can't see directly into the classroom spaces so there is an element of uh, privacy there uh, the screens also become uh, an element of uh, balustrade. So in some instances, they're just a screening element. And then in other instances, they're a balustrade where they, where they stop you from, from, they become our edge protection. Uh, and so they've also, we've also tried to use these instances to help soften what would have otherwise been a really big, um, chunky masonry retaining wall to hold uh, elements of the hill up where the building's been set down into the hill. So these double up in, in those regard. Uh, this is the, uh, the music department looking back at the building from the uh, western end uh, and where our ribbons start to, to talk back to the music building. In here, these are the details that are blasted, uh, that have been sandblasted into the concrete, uh, which is the, uh, the Highland um, Cathedral, cathedral uh, marching music, which has been, uh, which runs along that, uh, the divide between the two buildings that we saw and heads south towards the oval and then this is where we started to bring the maths and the music together so we have uh, pi heading off towards the left and the music heading off to the right so there's that, that integration of the two faculties together and then this was the the direct elevation of that uh, musical uh, element running through the screening. So you, it, it was taken from the way that the music dances across the, the sheet music. So we chose to include some less obvious learning opportunities uh, in, and hoped that these equations over time would seep into the memories of the students that would have lunch here on a daily basis. So this is one of three instances of volume uh, conversions that occur throughout the site um, that have been sandblasted into either the top or the side of our concrete planters or seats. Uh, all of the concrete um, work in the project is custom, uh, including the long tables and the uh, seating. Uh, to the left, which is just down here, which is a 20-sided uh, shape, which is an icosahedron. Uh, which uh, we've got in double in different sizes. So as we can, um, kids can do volume calculations uh, and, and surface, uh, area. surface area. Yeah. Uh, and then this is another image showing those elements in the back. The furniture here is uh, directly opposite the cafe, uh, which is also within that music building. So there's a lot of space here for, for students to break out and utilize the tables uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it's also near the pool. Uh, so for the, um, training, following training in the morning, there's the, uh, places for people to, to sit and eat. Um, this is more. For the... Okay, so here we've got um, numbers zero to nine in Morse code that can be found to the top of this seat. And then in the very, in the background, in this back corner, you can see that we've got Braille in um, showing numbers uh, one to nine as well. Um, so then students can take the zero to nine um, 
knowledge. knowledge and then uh, they can decipher three lots of four digit numbers that are located around the seating area and this is one of them. This is 1977 in Morse code uh, which alongside 1897 which is found elsewhere on the on the campus uh, are important founding dates of the college and then the third um, code to be found is the school's postcode. Uh, here we've got numbers 0 to 9 in Braille uh, to the top of the long table. Um, so this is my favourite element um, of the maths narrative, which is a really simple inclusion. That's 12 metres by 3 metres of uh, magnetic dots which are stuck into the paving, uh, which can form an XY axis um, that can be plotted by a whole class um, outside together using string and magnets. Um, so it's been sized appropriate for a whole class to use at once. Uh, and the fact that each magnetic dot is spaced at 250 mil increments over the 12 metre um, expanse, uh, the students could hypothetically measure jumping or uh, paper planes and the likes. There's also a chessboard um, snuck into the middle there. Um, so the school identified in their brief that um, they'd love an external Venn diagram, a compass and a unit circle as desirable inclusions. So we merged all three of them together to create um, this educational tool here, which is large enough for an entire class to use at once and could stand in different sections of the Venn diagram and show um, how um, that works. And then this is a close up of it. Uh, so it's made from stainless steel and then we've also etched into uh, the brickwork. And so that is uh, the end of our bit. Uh, I'll just talk to you quickly about the room that we're standing in, which is my favourite room in the building, which is the uh, dual teaching space or the lecture theatre. Uh, and I really love the ceiling uh, that you can see behind me, which is acoustic uh, and made up of timber. Uh, and it, this is my favourite room in the building. Thanks. All right, thanks very much, Andrew and Tilly. Really appreciate it. Um, up next, we've got Brad and Cara. Um, and Brad and Cara are also teaching in this building at the moment. So um, Cara is actually a mathematics teacher as well. So she was part of this. Um, and I'd like to throw over to them. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody. So what we're going to move through to now, and I'll just share my screen. Um, is a bit more of the, the teaching perspective. Um, so realistically, we made the decision to build a building and we were going to need to do some work around that with our architects. Um, one of the most important things, of course, was once we made that decision, we had to bring people on board because we had to um, start this journey that was going to be both a developmental journey um, and then also then what were we going to expect from the end of it. So we had different narratives that we needed to talk to. Um, so we need the executive to have a narrative, um, departments and why we were choosing maths and commerce, of course, because everybody wants a new building. Um, the staff perspective around that, um, why we were investing in this. The parents, we needed to tell them what we were going to do in the next two years and why there was gonna be disruption. And we wanted to have some student involvement in this perspective as well, um, as we created this perspective um, for them in the future. Um, because sometimes a year 12 student leaving doesn't understand why we're building on their side or we've got disruption. So we needed to talk to them and have their input. More importantly as well, we had the management control group that was chaired by then Peter Allen, um, our Director of Teaching and Learning. And it was really important to understand that when we put together this group, we had a maths representative with Scott on the group. Um, we had uh, technology, so that was um, Simon Holling said with the actual nitty gritty bits. You had myself who was doing technology integration, which is not often included in this. Um, usually we put technology in and then we do integration later. We made the decision to change that um, so that we knew that what was going to be put in was going to be used in this. Um, we had facilities um, with Mark Watts and then teaching and learning um, as we needed to and others as we needed to have them come in and out. Um, most important in all of this process you're going to see was the willingness, I suppose, of um, Taylor Robinson, Chain and Broderick to keep listening to us because um, we're quite a demanding group of people, as <laughs> Attili and um, Andrew would say, around the 26-page document that we provided to them. So we're, we're a hard group to keep going with. Um, finally, that we had to look at professional learning and development, not when we had the space, but prior to the building and what we were going to need to be doing in that space. And Cara talked a bit about that as well. If we think about what we did 
just purely transactionally in that we set up a Microsoft team. We had people um, conversing in there. We invited them to comment. Every time we had a management control meeting, we made sure we posted the plans to the group. We made sure it's uh, best possible they had the option to give us ideas. And so you can see this is a mass conversation, business center had a conversation, reprographics, and everybody had their bits and pieces around that because we wanted to feel consultative. One of the biggest things that teachers will gripe about with a new building is not feeling like they had contributing pieces to a building. So we wanted to remove all of that during this process. Um, some of the more interesting parts was um, when we were working with um, Lawrence and Nanico at that beginning stage around the plans, which you've seen now, is that we went through and created a 122 page keynote presentation around what we wanted to do. So this is an example of how we saw movements around a room, what we expected in each spot. Um, and then more importantly, we were, we were setting down some groundwork from the educational perspective that thank God they were willing to listen to. We even went down to what we expected from the lighting, how we wanted it to look. Um, and so we didn't want to leave anything to chance as educators around a $13 million building that we wanted to be really proud of. And, and that's what we were able to work with. Um, another example is we went out to different um, schools and had a look around at these ones. So this is from Brisbane um, Grammar School, I think it was. But we wanted to talk particularly around what we wanted in the open spaces and what our ideal pictures were. And, you know, how we wanted full glazing there. And we wanted to move, you know, um, around this particular pinch points and what we wanted the doors to do. We were really specific, I suppose, in this process. And, and I think all the way down to where we wanted electrical points, we didn't leave any of this sort of stuff to chance. So the process from us, from an educator perspective to an architect, was probably a very detailed brief, is, is what I'm sort of getting to. And not everything stayed like this. This was our first go around, and then we threw it back at the groups. Um, and I think that's an important part of this, that you can't ever stick with just the single point of um, when you did it the first time. Um, when we talk about technology, which is my you know, pet project, I suppose, in my role at the school as an integrator, is we had to look at what we wanted to do. So we went minimalist in some areas and then really hard in other areas. So everything's wireless, for example, we wanted to deal with laser projectors in our rooms. We're an Apple distinguished school. So everybody has a Mac or an iPad in some kind. We had Apple TVs mounted properly. We sought, um, we made sure that our laser projectors were the biggest possible screen size we possibly can. And Lawrence would understand when we say that we were really particular on how much this mattered to us. So we had a 103 centimeter projection and people will ask us, well, why in your building did you not just simply put in TVs? Well, we're in a maths building and maths people really like to write on whiteboards. So why would we compromise in that? And we could say technology is good, but we wanted to have best of both worlds. And so large projection onto um, whiteboards, as well as some other things made our best of both worlds. We also wanted to make sure that we were future proofing. So everything in our building from an ethernet perspective had dual ethernet, you know, we had lots of con discussions around why that is. Um, we, um, everything's controlled by a central C bus system. We have full BMS in the building. We have a custom Crestron system in the lecture theater, so we can have lots of different things happening. And we invested in the Skyfold doors um, because we wanted to have that ease of use. If you've ever had bifold doors in your buildings, most of you attending today, you either love or hate them or they never get used. So we wanted to try another way of doing that. Um, when we look at technology just outside of this room where you've got with us, we now have an open space where we put up mass challenges in the same sort of display, uh, perspective as bright sign um, digital display systems. Um, on the right hand side is um, five displays connected together, which can be networked as one piece. This will have stocks showing on them. Um, this will have um, all manner of business announcing information because you're about to walk into the business area of that. Um, and they can be flexible and customized for times and dates. We then made some really critical decisions around room booking. So this is the rooms we're sitting in, Lawrence um, and Lee and myself, as well as the lecture theatre. We wanted to make sure it was easy to book rooms. And so on every um, door, you've got this panel. Um, we're using an app for this. And you can tap on the app to book it ad hocly. You can see the bookings in the future. You can book for 60 minutes. Students are encouraged to book into the rooms and use the rooms as much as possible. Um, so they can use them and you can see on the right hand side that's two students that have just wandered into that room. Um, the display is saying red so they've, they've manually booked that room for a while and then if they um, if a teacher has booked it over the top of them they wouldn't be able to book it. Like so the onus is on the teacher is also to be organized. 
um, uh, and which is an interesting part of a school to deal with. Lecture theatre, just a quick view around what technology we put into here. So this has full recording capabilities. It's got cameras, um, it's got presets, it's got dual displays for the perspective of a student participating in a class. So the teacher can be presenting their keynote on one side and the student can be air playing theirs to the other side so that you could have the, you know, Johnny, can you please show me your working out for X? Or can you contribute to a group a larger discussion by showing what you mean by Y? And so you can either do it in two different ways to do that. So you can have single display or not in relation to two people displaying at once. And all of that can be recorded by the touch of a button. Um, big tip is that we changed it so that when you start a presentation, you chose to record, you hit yes or no, but then it told you to pick up the mic because teachers and students are really bad at actually understanding that audio is an important part of the process if they push record. So we changed some of our usability perspectives on that. Finally, two years before this building, and so we're saying this is how prepared we were trying to be for this building, is that we started to issue iPads to our math staff and commerce staff because we wanted to release them from the front of the room. So you can't just do that by having a building and then saying, okay, now I'll release you from the front of the room. And so you don't need your laptop anymore. So on the left, you've got um, one of our heads of, um, uh, heads of house in actual fact that actually has an office in this building is using an iPad with pencil to display the Casio app, you know, and he is fully mobile within that room while all the other students are still poor things using an actual calculator um, at the moment. So in the other side of that room, you've got a maths teacher solving equations as they're going by recording um, by using a OneNote um, and the kids are then using that to either view it and watch that back or solve that quick question as well. What's no, most um, gratifying, I suppose, about this is that two years of effort when you walk through the building now as an integrator, this is just happening. So the building is one thing to let it all just happen inside it and we interact with it um, and you've got to prepare for a building. And I suppose I'll hand over to Cara that'll talk to you about, well, once you've got a building and you prepare for the building, what happens after you've got your building? And so what, that's, that's probably a really understated part of this process. Thanks, Brad. Um, just listening to what Brad had to say, there I think that there's also the bigger picture around pedagogy and teaching practice and so um, there's one thing that a building has the capacity to do all of these things it's another thing for teachers to have a reason um, as to why that they need to deliver in a different way so um, at Scotch we're delivering a future focused curriculum that's intending to build adaptable and independent learners that have a strong skill set in those five elements listed that you see in that image on the right. So we're all about building self-management, research, communication, social and thinking skills. And these are complex skills to build and we layer them into our teaching by um, first thinking about how we could explicitly teach those skills and then using the content as the lens to be able to deliver that experience. So what we know is that traditional um, didactic teaching of standing up the front stand and deliver isn't actually going to bring out those skills those skills need um, to be carefully designed through our teeth through our lessons and then um, we need to be uh, offering um, collaboration research presentation and problem solving in our lessons to be able to get our students to practice those and then develop those skills along a continuum from novice through to leader. So I guess that's the premise as to what this building um, uh, is supporting teachers to be able to do. And our teachers are very much on board with this journey in teaching the approaches to learning. So, as I said previously, contemporary practices offer that flexible, collaborative, student-focused um, way of delivering lessons. And what you see here isn't actually six different lessons, it's, it's actually the one lesson. So, um, I'm team teaching with a teacher who's in the lecture theatre. So the boys started off there and they were delivered um, in there. The, the theory was delivered and they, um, I suppose, an introduction to the conceptual side of what they were learning. Um, and then from there, they were able to break out into the open area, which is just outside of it. And then the boys 
were given the opportunity to work in small groups um, in whatever way they liked. So you can see on the top right hand side, a group of boys um, booked the space and worked in there on, on the whiteboard and also projected their work. We have other boys working around a learning pod. Um, and then you've got the other boys projecting to the screen and, and discussing the concepts on there. So as a teacher, you're able to move around between those spaces and, and encourage the boys to think um, you know, in different ways and to problem solve through the problems and to question. So you're not guiding the learning, it's all about the student's focus and inquiry process. So the building speaks volumes. I think this is one of my favorite features of the building is just the embedded learning throughout. When we talk about um, learning that, uh, you know, surrounding us, it, it's rarely actually the case. So to have all of these um, attributes of a building that, that talk mathematics is phenomenal. And I think it's really inspiring to students. So you see those, um, icosahedrons on the left hand side that they're all different shapes and sizes so perfect um, for volume for calculating surface area one of my favorite things is looking at that and thinking at what distance do I need to stand so that a two-dimensional perspective of those are equal so that they're they appear to be the same size so that brings in those ideas of thinking skills and um, on the bottom left hand side is a binary code that has a really nice maths um, proverb behind it and the boys can then uh, solve that. Um, we've got the radian measures and unit circle which we're using all the time to, treat, to teach trig um, and then up the wall tessellations, conics, we've got um, the geometry on the ground. So it's about getting out you know and using this space and then coming back into the classroom and talking about that getting boys to figure out their own elements of what they understand by being in this environment so again part of this uh, big shift is towards fostering that independence so as i said before those traditional teaching methods just weren't fostering independent learning and we know from this generation that they're going to need to be able to self-educate continually as this world evolves so having them take a more mature approach to their learning, which is I think why the features of this building um, have a mature feel to it. It's supposed to be a business center or um, a place where students can book rooms. And as long as they're in here discussing the learning, which they are because of the way that the rooms are built and they ins inspires them to do so, um, it's building that sense of independence in them. And then finally, I think it's about changing the way that we work. So you can see here, it, it, it just offers extraordinary opportunities. So as I said before, we can throw a number of classes together in the lecture theatre, which gives frees up time for other staff members to um, maybe generate, create resources um, that, you know, one staff member can use. So if we are delivering that content, we can do it in that space. Um, it's also about bringing the commerce and math staff room together. So traditionally, um, the, the departments would be in their silos around the schools. So having these two together means that there's more kind of cross pollination with regards to ideas. Um, and on the right, I just wanted to share, this was me yesterday. I had to take some carer's leave for some sick children. But um, what I was able to do is because of the learning spaces, I've got two classrooms either side of me with glass windows. So I actually delivered the lesson from home and my year 12 boys um, came into the class. They sat um, at their desk. Um, the supervision was on either side of the classroom. And then I projected, um, my iPad and taught the lesson. Um, we interacted, I asked them questions, they got on with a full lesson's worth of learning that I guess ordinarily a relief teacher would have stepped in for and they would have got on with, you know, with their own work. So really valuable in that context and really exciting from, you know, this respect. And um, finally, I think Brad said, is, you know, it, it's about managing change. And even this has been um, quite an experience for me. Certainly COVID impacted our process, I think. I think we would have loved, um, you know, the landscape architects and the design architects to come in and actually speak about 
uh, what this building has the capacity to do. I mean, even listening to it today, I just find it astonishing at how much thought and detail has gone into that. And I think often we make the assumption that people know more than they do. Um, and changing the space, I guess it, it doesn't necessarily mean the teaching's going to change. So it's gonna take a lot from us to, to give uh, staff the time to go back and to share um, their experiences, to give them time to design creative lessons and then to deliver those, to tell them that it's okay to take risks um, and to explore and that not everything is gonna be a success. Understanding how to use the technology because it is, quite complex and it's not just single mode delivery. We're looking at multimodal and trying to bring that in. Um, and then I think students need permission to operate differently as well. It's really unique space for them. And typically it's been stand outside the classroom, the teacher arrives, you enter into the classroom. This, this is a building, this is the learning space and it's all around them. And if they want to um, engage with it and, um, and use this space in a mature and adult way, then they're free to do so. Uh, and, and again, staff also need that permission as well to take risks and to, um, to engage with students in a different way as well. So thanks, Scott, that's um, our presentation. So we'll hand it back to you and look forward to receiving some questions. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Brad and Kara. Um, so it's great. We've actually got quite a few questions coming through, which is excellent. Um, and there were lots of bits and pieces that I picked up from everyone's presentations where it was really, really lovely to see different parts of people are highlighting and then see that I've actually been able to use them in my own teaching as well, um, which is really nice. Uh, so let's see. Um, we've got a few questions here. I might see if I can get um, Liesl up first, if I can get that. So we're going to essentially try something where, rather than me just asking someone's question that's come through the Q&A, actually trying to get uh, someone to talk, almost like a walkie-talkie style, so we know video from them, um, and ask the question. And that way, they can also ask follow-up or ask for clarification. Uh, the time is five o'clock at the moment, so we'll see how we go. We've got um, a few questions, but we'll try and um, probably wrap it up in about 10 to 15-ish. Uh, Liesl, um, I've just put you on as allowing to talk. Um, are you able to speak and hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so oh, I'm cool. talking all the way from Victoria. So thank you very much for letting us um, be part of this um, school tour. We don't normally get to tour schools in uh, Western Australia, so it's really good. Um, my question is probably for the architects, but um, others can answer as well. I'm, I'm interested in whether you design differently when you're thinking about schools for boys versus schools for girls or co-ed schools? And, and if you do, is there a risk that you're actually entrenching existing gender stereotypes? Cool. That's a good one to start with. It is. Sorry, I, I saw that question Lisa put through and I went, yes. Yeah. Um, so as a house head, we've been teaching recently and talking about masculinity and what it is to be masculine and stereotypes. So it's a, it's a really great question. I mean, architecturally, I think um, in terms of how we design the buildings on the inside, um, in terms of planning relationships, the spaces that we develop, um, I don't think that we do think any differently, really, whether they're being used by um, males or females. Certainly with the outside of the building, uh, and Andy or Tilly, you might like to jump in here as well. Um, certainly some of the, the, the way that boys and girls maybe use the exterior spaces around the, build, around the building can be a little bit different. Um, certainly from my experience in watching my daughter go to a private single sex girls school, um, certainly they were less, they were more likely to sit in small groups and talk at lunchtimes and recess um, whereas my time here at Scotch and watching the boys uh, today at Scotch, there's a lot more 
a lot more move, moving around, a little bit more robust activity at both of those break times. So the spaces that are created on the outside um, do need to accommodate those, those differences. But from an educational point of view, the inside, um, I don't I mean, think I would, we, we would differentiate. Just to time in here, Lee, we would say that we never really considered a gender perspective. The only no. thing that we were really, as a male, that I was, that we insisted on, I suppose, and that was one thing that was in the original designs was tiered seating. I suppose um, in the very beginning, we were, a lot of schools these days are designing tiered seating, um, but they're short shelf tiered seating so that you can do group uh, meetings. Um, for a guy, we don't usually sit cross-legged. Do you know what I mean? We want to sit with our back against something and we don't, it, there's just reasons anatomically why we don't sit in certain ways. And so if you think about what we're targeting here, a 14 to 18 year old, that is the only perspective that we don't sort of, we didn't, we didn't bring into the designs that, yes, you're right, girls will sit in small groups on the floor, cross-legged and, and chat and laid around. Guys want to sit at, a, at a, something that's comfortable with our back to something generally or you know can lean forward on something and we're up that's the only thing that we considered that was ever different for the gender from just to chime in there from a landscape perspective we work across um uh, co-ed schools uh single sex schools uh, and we do a lot of studies of how students uh, use the external spaces and the, the items that we mentioned for, before about um, typically girls wanting to have smaller, smaller spaces for their groups to be in um, and the boys wanting more space to be able to run and be active. Uh, typically that is uh, what we see. But in terms of the way we design things, we try to challenge those. Uh, and we've done some work at a, at a girls' school recently where we've tried to challenge that and provide some active space to try and keep uh, girls moving and be active uh, where typically they were we're stopping to doing that. Uh, and then also within the, the um, externally within this project, we've created a number of spaces that have different sizes for different groups. So it gives everyone the opportunity to be in uh, either in a large group if they want to, or be in smaller groups. And, and so I think probably we're, we, are, we understand how typically people have worked in those spaces, but we try and make sure that we, uh, are getting a diversity of spaces that enables everyone to be comfortable in those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lisa, is that kind of... as well, Scott? Um, we actually run cross campus classes, so you know we have a hundred odd girls on campus as well. So um, we have a bus that runs between our sister school PLC and us. So um, when we were designing the building, we actually really did consider girls because. Um, you know, that's something that's new to Scotch College in, well, at least in the last six years. So considering the facilities that we had, we actually had to broaden some of those facilities to cater for, you know, girls being able to use bathrooms and toilets and, and to make sure our toilets are gender neutral as well. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, someone did actually ask a question in there and they asked why were there no urinals? And I suppose that essentially answers it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I might see if I can uh, get Michael Silbert um, to ask his question. Um, Michael, are you able to talk? Hi, hi. You got me? Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Michael Silbert. I'm an ex-Scotch boy as well, and I sit on the School Foundation and um, really, uh, really thrilled to see the um, incredible... Uh, effort and investment that you guys have all made in this project because it's an absolute perler. Um, I just had a quick question really, um, COVID notwithstanding, what's the immediate um, feedback from users, from students and from staff and in particular, you know, is there anything that really surprised you about uh, how, the, how the building was received once it was filled up with sweaty bodies? <laughs> I can answer that one. Thanks, Michael. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the watching the students go through on the first day, um, and Lee was actually here as well, and um, yeah, I think they were just blown away. I think they were just walking around with their, you know, jaw aghast, looking at, 
at um, the building and sort of finding all the hidden treasures in it. Um, I, I think at first, uh, I don't think that they use the building to its full capacity and, and we really had to say, you know, you can book that space or, you know, you're welcome to stay here. You can eat your lunch here. Or um, I think for them, it was, you know, such a, um, such an outstanding building that, that I guess they were a bit intimidated to use it. But, but now you look at them and they quickly own things here. <laughs> so the boys are adjusted nicely. But yeah, the feedback is certainly from my SL map maths class that I have on the top floor who believe that they are in the best room in the entire building. They absolutely love it. And they do mention that coming to class for maths, and I'm sure it's for my teaching, but you know, second to that is the fact that they love being in there because of the space and they're really complimentary of it. Mm. And I think they were actually blown away by the delivery, uh, how, you know, that, that, that I could deliver remotely to them and it was completely an interactive class where I was challenging them um, with it, you know, with the tech that's in there. Just, just amazing. I've, I mean, I would never dream to be able to do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the feedback I've gotten as well. Um, my year 12 leaders in my house have been asking whether or not they can stay here past 5 p.m. to keep studying and use the group meeting spaces, which has uh, been amazing. Um, hopefully that helps, Michael. It's fantastic. It's great to hear. And hopefully the teachers want to stay after hours too. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Um, you may have seen before myself um, and our landscape architects had to stand up and move around. Our um, lights automatically turn off after an hour. <laughs> um, well, let's see. So, um, Kirsty, um, Kirsty Stewart, I'll see if I can put you on to ask your question. Um, Kirsty, are you able to talk? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, hi. I know. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Um, yeah. Look, I'm an architect, but um, in my, actually, my mum happens to live a couple of doors down from Scott, so I've always been curious, walking the dog on the oval for many years, what's, what's behind the walls. Um, so, no, it's great to see that. And obviously, I work in education, so I'm fascinated with um, working in other schools, um, actually how Scotch, car particularly um, how you roll out your pedagogy internally in terms of um, making sure that your staff are on board with what you're doing and how that was done prior to the commencement of the project. So prior to you briefing architects, I've worked on projects where in education, you'll then go to talk to the staff and they are actually either surprised or not engaged and actually don't use the space or don't understand why. And <laughs> then, yeah, so the pedagogy is such an important process. I'm just fascinated with how that works at Scotch for you. I think that was um, probably a, a five year journey because I mean, anything like this is it, not just the building, but it's an entire cultural shift, I think. And, um, you know, that is really genuinely about bringing people on board. If you're going to implement an entire curriculum that's actually not mandated to be taught, um, you really need to, and you've got a high performance staff like we do, you've really got to give them that rationale and reason. So when I said that we did a research project, that, that research project lasted for at least six months for collecting data, working with the curriculum leadership team to unpack that data, to have a look at what we believed, um, you know, contemporary pedagogy would look like at a school like this. Um, and then it was about running pilot projects, building websites that we could centralise our data. Um, and then we do things like professional development carousels where staff are sharing their ideas. So we don't use a lot of external professional development. We drive it from within because we believe that um, our staff are experienced enough to be able to come up with fantastic ideas and we support them to do so. So um, part of this, it's, it's a very, very long process. And I'm, I'm obviously really proud of our, our skills curriculum and, um, and that's, you know, what you'll see is the cognitive curriculum. It, it's not just with inside the classroom. It broadens to what happens on the playing field, what happens through our community and service program, what happens in our pastoral 
spaces. So it's the integration of all of those things that develop a really well-rounded young men to be, you know, a strong member of and a positive member of society. I think also then we, we invested in staff at the end of the day with this building. Like we invested in a maths and commerce staff as well. So we made a deliberate effort to make sure that, you know, when we were doing this in this particular learning area, there's not too many schools building new maths blocks, you know, these days, like there's not, you know, a maths classroom from a parent's perspective is the same classroom as ever. So we've got that challenge over the next year or two years to say, right, if on the lower ground level, you've got a collaborative space in the indoor, you've got then the central space, you know, where your classroom is, and then you can move out to the open area on Shenton Road. Why did we create three spaces in a math class? Well, we wanted the, the students to be able to choose where to move within that space and in that group, as well as then have the didactic piece of the teacher at the beginning. But then maybe in the next couple of years, we need to be preparing them for self-learning. So teachers, in, especially with COVID, creating those videos of how to do math solutions, you know, commerce, how to do accounting equations, and then how to solve those equations by recording those videos. And then the teacher becoming the facilitator and a lecturer, you know, and a mentor to a mm. group of students in three different spots. You know, that takes time. But I would say even pleasantly today, walking around and taking a couple of photos in for today, because I wanted to make sure that was relevant as possible. It is slowly happening. It's, it's amazing how you can change a space and change people's mindset at the same time. I think also videos, videos can teach content, but people need to teach skills. Yep. You know, like that ability to be able to give in the moment feedback, um, you know, to, to help them to grow in terms of communication and social skills is just such a critical part of it. And I guess that what, that's what drives us. But thank you for your question. It was a very good one. Can I, can I just add to that and just say that um, the brief, uh, probably got the impression that the brief was uh, pretty thick. Uh, and it was. Um, and it was very detailed. But it was very clear. Um, the, the, the way that Scotch wanted to teach in this building was very, very clear um, right from the very beginning. And that was really driven by uh, um, oh, Brad and, and Pete um, uh, in that early, uh, in those early um, uh, sessions. And, um, you know, they, they were very good at um, taking the politics out of the um, design of a building, which we often forget that does happen. Um, and the messaging was always about how are we going to teach in this building? So well done, Brad and Pete, if you're listening. <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's really, in really interesting. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got Sam. I might put him through as one of our last few questions. Um, it's absolutely been amazing um, being able to see all the questions coming through. Um, Sam, are you able to speak at all? Yeah, hi. And I'm a girl. Sorry, I probably should have had Samantha. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, like everyone else has said, thanks so much for offering this. I'm in New South Wales and we're in the um, process of building a, an amazing senior school up in Cessnock. But I did live in Panawanica in the Pilbara for many years and we did have some of our boys join you. Um, for high school. So it is great to see, um, yeah, what kids who live in very remote parts of Western Australia um, in nice, wealthy mining communities um, get the, the benefit of, um, yeah, what you've created. Now, my question was, so where we're looking at, yeah, what the senior building looks like, why did you put a lecture theatre in when it, your other spaces are so open? So what was the theory behind that? So uh, it was interesting because originally there were four more GLAs. If I'm really honest, the original original idea was to put four more GLAs in, um, two in the lecture theatre and two in the open space. So we sat down and said, well, how many more classrooms do we need? You know, how much room utilisation has we got in the timetable? You know, what are we trying to achieve by this? What if we could buddy the, you know, we have three grid lines of Year 9 maths happening at the same time, and those maths teachers are potentially teaching the same core content realistically at the same time. So 
how about we started to think a little bit differently about this and then prepare them a little bit for the concept of university, even though that's changing every day. But we then said, well, if we put Scott, for example, in there with Debbie Lee, who's teaching the, the year nines and said, how, hey, Scott, you're really good at teaching this concept of maths and your class is always doing very well in this sort of one as an, as an average and that sort of stuff. How about we team teach that thing in the theater together? So you take that, Scott, and then the other teacher is released in order to do one-on-one -on -one with a student or however that was meant to go down. But we wanted them to record that lesson very easily as well using the system. And then, the te and then basically Scott and the other teacher would break out into the space. We could have achieved that by opening the doors, um, but we also acknowledged the fact that when we were doing that, we wanted it to feel different. So we didn't want it to feel classroom-like at that sort of stage. And so the goal will be over the next year or so in the two years is to say, you know, when I'm doing certain teaching in certain ways, let's choose the space that makes sense for that teaching rather than always just going to the GLA. So yeah. meetings, if you look back at the slides, Nathan Kime has booked the lecture theatre, like all the, you know, every other day thereabouts. And he's a commerce teacher who's got a classroom assigned to him. But in some respects, he's using both spaces for two different things. And he's also bringing in one of his other, he's the head of the department, he's bringing in another person who's teaching the same course into that same space. And then that teacher is actually working with one of the weaker kids out in the open space in actual fact. And then also on top of that, they're then creating resources in fact for to forward. So the desire around the lecture theatre wasn't necessarily a lecture theatre, as in, you know, go in there and do didactic. Um, for all the time, it was more a case of if we were going to deliver content didactically and we knew that we were going to have to do that in some respects, let's do this the most efficiently, the most creatively, um, the, the most recorded way to do it in a room so that we could have it once and have that best teacher teach that piece because we know we're teaching six streams or eight streams of a particular content. And then we actually wanted another space as well that wasn't you know, we've got a 700 seat lecture theatre realistically in our centre. We've got a 268 and now we've got the like the 75 or 76. So we can do... It's a perfect space for teacher professional development to mm -hmm. give parent um, to, you know, when you know that you're going to get maybe 50 or 70 parents turning up to, to speak to them in what is probably a bit more of an intimate space than our... 250 seat lecture theatre. So I think it's again, Sam, the diversity that you see around this building is the opportunity to choose the space for the occasion. And, um, and it's really nice. Uh, yeah, it's been really good in that sense of watching how people have used it. Mm. No, that's fair. And I think when we're all designing schools with these incredible open spaces, we still need to make sure we do have a place where we can really engage in incredible explicit teaching and those rich conversations. Because when you have those big open learning spaces, that can get lost. Um, so no, I was just really interested because I think it's a good idea. I just wanted to know what you thought. <laughs> it is an odd thing to be in lecture theatres these days. People did ask us a few times and we're yeah. like, look, yeah. we believe that we can still utilise the space to deliver a better form of teaching when we need to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from my perspective as well, it's also the idea of almost like the F word flexible versus having things that are purposeful. And yes, it's good to have things that are flexible in some ways, but you also need to have things that have a real purpose and that people know what they are for. Um, and when I look at, say, our landscaping as well, I very much see that. There's lots of spaces that have purpose, um, but there are also flexibility to it as well. I suppose the other thing is, don't forget, we were building very clearly a building for the future as well. So this is a building that's going to be here for a long time. You know, so it's very easy to get stuck thinking, what do I need tomorrow? So us going, I need four more GLAs, wasn't necessarily what we thought we were going to need in five years time or 10 years time. We thought that potentially life is going to get more interesting. The pandemic certainly made that an interesting <laughs> time, you know, trying to release a brand new building and have no students in it, which you know what I mean, was, a, was an interesting experience for us. Um, 
But that in the future perspective is why we didn't put as many PowerPoints in classrooms because everybody wants PowerPoints in classrooms because they think they're going to plug in their tech. Well, we think in five years, six years time, batteries won't be like that anymore. So why spend all that expense? You know, we were, we would, we were adjusting things. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll just put one last question through, which is coming through from a few people. Um, and they're basically asking about the idea of how the students were involved in this process. So people are asking, um, were they involved in the collaboration process? To what extent? Um, yeah, just wanted to put that through to everyone as our last question. Yeah, so um, as, as Lawrence mentioned, Peter Allen was obviously instrumental in all of this process and um, a lot of the inspiration, um, I guess, uh, of that initial brief that I did is thanks to him. Um, he had incredible vision. But one of the things that he also wanted was um, student voice. And uh, he uh, arranged for uh, students to go out to Curtin University and work with the building department there and um, to uh, reimagine what learning spaces would be like. So he spent the day with those students and they sort of looked at designing if they could have you know anything that they wanted within a teaching space what would it look like so um, all of that was kind of captured throughout that day but I think one of the things he said to me um, during that time was that he he probably hoped that they had been a little bit more visionary with it um, but understood that when you're just used to something always being a certain way that it's really hard to explore and imagine well and truly beyond that. So um, I certainly think that he's incorporated many of their ideas and features into that um, where boys are wanting difference, inspiring um, visuals around them that they, you know, want the ability to be able to collaborate. So I guess uh, that's, you know, that was sort of his role in that. He'll probably have a better answer than we would around that one. We had, um... We had the student council and we, we went and talked to them on a fair few issues as well. Um, and they furniture. had input into furniture choices furniture. because yeah. of course furniture is a big thing for them. Had um, to sit on everything. We had it all in the library and every piece of furniture that was ever considered went through the library and the boys raided it. So <laughs> they, were, they were interactive in that one. They also then, if you were here now, one of the things we didn't do yet is we haven't, um, sort of finished off all the walls and that we haven't finished off the spaces yeah. because it would have been very easy to fill the spaces and design the walls and, you know, put all the graphic artwork up. The problem with that is that then the student has no ownership of say the year 12 common room. You know, that's a very blank canvas. We put in a couple of nice pieces of furniture, but basically now we want them to say, well, what else do I want? So, you know, do they want more microwaves in their particular space? You know, probably, you know, um, do they want to be able to use the open space later? Do they want more furniture that does X or Y? Um, do they need to use the lecture theatre? Can we use the, the meeting rooms more often? You know, those sorts of things. And do we want more? They have, they have one of their requests was two meeting rooms in their space. Um, so they wanted to be able to have just for the year 12s, you know, because of course you build a building with a common room or a room in it for the year 12s, it's their building. You know, no matter what you do, it's, it's their building. Um, so they have two rooms that's dedicated just to them and then the year 11s and the rest of the school can use the other rooms as well. So no staff can book those spaces because that was one of the things that they wanted um, as part of the brief. And we were respectful of that request. Um, it's interesting that a student, as Cara said, a student is so used, we train them so well by the time they get to year 12 about what a school is meant to be that sometimes they really struggle to imagine what a school could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. And so we were struggling like that concept from the Walkman to the iPod, you know, <laughs> the, the jump from the Walkman to the iPod became problematic for some conversations. You were basically having to lead them to the iPod, you know, so what does a classroom look like? Well, why can't I open on both sides, you know? That sort of, that was like, a, oh yeah, that would be great. Anyway. Um, Brilliant. Thanks very much. Are there any other last comments before we wrap up from anyone? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Kara and Brad. 
and thank you, Andrew and Tilly, very, very much. Um, just a last, also thank you to our WA sponsors, um, Armstrong Flooring, Armstrong Ceiling Solutions, Breezeway Woods Furniture and Decor Systems. Um, they're massive sponsors of the Association for Learning Environments and they're part of the reason that we can do this. Um, a massive thank you to everyone as well, especially people in New Zealand where it's uh, past 9 p.m. Um, thank you very much to people from outside WA and have a great night. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, BCCM, as well. Great events. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Thanks, Scott.